I just combine these three things, entrepreneurship, basketball, computers. I could do that. Social media was starting to become a thing. And I'm a, again, I told you I'm an internet guy. I started using all these things. So when I did that, I said, man, I could do this forever. I got plenty of ideas. I had to figure out life in the middle of my career. So I had already had my next thing figured out. I knew exactly what it was going to be by the time I stopped playing because I already had it going. The momentum was already there. So I wasn't starting from zero. There's a difference between a dream chaser and a dream catcher. Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Dream Catchers podcast. I'm your host, Jerome. And we are down in South Florida today. I got my man Dre Baldwin in with me. He's a coach of the top 2% performers and teams, but he didn't start there. And we're going to have a fascinating conversation. I have more and more people coming up to me and saying, Jerome, why aren't you helping athletes? Why they are going through exits. They probably experience an even deeper drop than founders when they leave their business. What's up with that? Why are you staying away from that? And I say, I, I'm niched. I'm specifically targeted on founders. But Dre is a former professional athlete, and he's been able to find meaning, significance on the backside of leaving that professional sport. So, Dre, with that kind of as a backdrop, man, welcome in, and thanks for coming on the Dreamcatchers podcast. Jerome, thank you for having me on. I'm excited for this conversation. How are you? Amazing, brother. Thank you. So, I mean, I, I told them kind of what you do i told you where you've been but mm. you know it's different when it comes from the person who actually did it right you get it from the horse's mouth so let, let's talk about it man you, you look like a pretty tall fella in the pictures that i've seen i assume you you were a basketball player at some point in time yes yeah, basketball i'm six four man kind of, kind of tall yeah like well easy. i mean for the general population i, I think yeah. the average height for a guy is less than six feet so i mean yeah, you, <laughs> yeah my dad's like five eight so yeah he's about average height wow wow okay so yeah. t- give us a story man like playing professional basketball is elite man so how, how did you like kind of progress on that journey to get to that space a great question. So it was not in the cards for me to become a professional athlete, Jerome. So we could start there. So I didn't start playing basketball until I was 14. I what? played other sports. You know, I played you no know, touch football, tried to go football, I never really played seriously, played baseball, you no know, backyard sports, all of that. But I never really focused on basketball until I was 14. So I was in my freshman year of high school. I only played one year of high school basketball. And that one year I had uh the best thing about that season is that I had front row seats to the games because I was sitting right on the bench, you know, watching the games. <laughs> You know, on varsity? So, Were you on varsity, varsity though? We only had one team. So where I, oh. where I come from, I'm from Philly. So at that time, our schools were very underfunded. So it was just one team, no assistant coach, just one coach. He was like a help teacher and he was the coach. And you either made that team or you didn't play. So I finally made it as a senior and I sat the bench. So you no, know, getting out of high school, nobody was checking for me to go play college ball because I had no resume. So I knew I was going to go to college just on the you know, academics and just as a person, I wanted to go to college, but nobody, no coach at a college was looking for me. So I had to walk on. So for those who don't know what that means, that means you just walk in and you literally try to play your way onto the roster, which I was able to do, but I was playing, I was at a division three college at, oh, man. Athletically, it was a division three school. So you know, Division Three doesn't produce pro players don't come out of D3 schools. They come out of the D1 stuff you see on TV. So we are D3 down in the basement. And I played, but, you know, again, who cares? Uh, you're playing D3. You're playing against a bunch of guys who have no aspirations of playing pro. So getting out of school, and this is 2004 to give everybody a, a time frame here, again, because th- that matters. My first year out of school, I did not play basketball immediately. I went and got a couple, quote, unquote, regular jobs. So my first job out of college, Jerome, was as an assistant manager of Foot Locker. That, that was the first really thing I did exciting. when I graduated. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. And then I went and worked at a gym called Bally Total Fitness. You remember them? Yeah. And uh, they are out of business now, not because of me. I did a lot. I saw I sold a lot of memberships, right? but they are out of business now. So I worked at Bally six months, for after six months. Then in the summer of 2005, I went to this event called an exposure camp. You ever heard of those? Familiar with yeah. them? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So that's basically for those who don't know, it's like a place that you go if you're trying to get on in sports, but nobody knows you. It's similar to a job fair. Right? You're trying to get a job, but nobody has ever heard of you. So you show up to the job fair, try to basically talk your way into a job. But in the sports world, you got to play. You play your way into a job. So exposure camp is literally you are performing in front of decision makers. So it's about 200 of us guys who all thought we were good enough to play pro, but none of us is. So we're all in there trying to prove that we're good. So it's like a casting call. And it's a meat market. And I played pretty good at this exposure camp. And I had to actually negotiate with my boss at Bally Total Fitness to get the weekend off so I could go to the exposure camp. <laughs> because the oh, camp was man. in Orlando. 
All right, Cam was in Orlando, and I'm from Philly. So we rented a car in Philly and drove to Orlando to go play in this exposure camp. You know, and this is a strain on me because I'm working at Valley Total Fitness, going to my parents' house. Like, this is this is a financial reach. Like, that camp was $250. I had to pay in cash. I didn't even have a credit card or a bank account at that time, age uh, 23. All right, Ooh. so I go to this exposure camp, play pretty good, drive back to Philly. I had to be back at work on Monday. And I started cold calling basketball agents. Now, anybody who knows the sports world or the entertainment world, you probably understand that agents usually call the talent. All right, they call you because they're trying to represent you because you represent an opportunity to make money. Because when you make money, they make money. But again, nobody knew who I was, so I had to call them. So this, I had, I was doing this whole situation in reverse. Right? I'm calling agents and trying to sell them on representing me. Right. So I called about 60 agents. Right. I called 60 of them. Now I went on Google, which did exist back then. And any agent who had a phone number, I called them. I called about 60. I got in touch with 20 and 20 of them said, let me see what you got. So I sent them my scouting report from this exposure camp because I played pretty good at the camp. So the scouting report was online and then I had to send them the footage. Now this footage was not a link. It was a VHS tape. You remember VHS tapes? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So, so I had to, I had a double decker VCR at home. So anybody under 30 listening to this, if you just Google it or ask your parents VCR VHS, they'll explain it to you. And I had a double decker VCR. I would make copies on my VHS tape because I didn't want to send them the master tape. And I'm sending this in bubble mail or it's in the mail to agents all around the world who said, let me see what you got. And again, this is a strain on me. I'm working in Valley Total Fitness, going to my parents' home. Like it's not How like much I got did that kinda, cost, man. That sounds yeah. I didn't, I didn't have a marketing budget, right? So yeah, these each tape was. I mean, I went to the store called Eckert. I don't know if they still exist, but I went to Eckert. They're out. They're gone. Yeah. So I went to Eckert. Like it was like CVS for those who don't know. And I would make. I would buy the ten pack of blank VHS tapes and then make copies and then send them out. So the ten pack is probably about maybe fifteen bucks. And then I had to mail them out. So the bubble mail was about a dollar fifty a piece. And then the mailing, the actual the actual shipping was about four or five dollars, right? So I'm taking all the money I got and putting it into this, right? So what made that's you what believe? What made you believe, bro? There was nothing yeah. except for having a good exposure day, right? right? Well, even before that, because I mean, I had to spend money to even go to the exposure camp before I performed, right? So um, when people ask me that, Jerome, my answer is I was just dumb enough to keep trying. Because logically, rationally, I should not have been trying. Because given my background, I should have just said, okay, I have my little time in basketball. That was cool. Let me move on and go do something that I have a reasonable shot at succeeding at. I did not have a reasonable shot at succeeding at basketball. But I was foolish enough to believe that I might be able to make it happen. And that's the only reason that I kept trying. That's crazy. But did you did you have that? that belief in yourself all the way through, like I can do anything. I'm going to do whatever it takes. Like, yes. Where did that come from? Man, that's a, that's existential question. I think it comes from the fact that even from the time I was probably about age 16, I decided that basketball is the route that I want to take. That's the thing that I want to do. I knew I was going to go to school. I knew I was going to go to college, but I knew I didn't want to take, you know, I didn't want to quote unquote use my degree from college. I wanted to do the sports thing. I knew I wanted to do that. And then I got introduced to entrepreneurship in college. And that's when I said, okay, I'm going to do sports and I'm going to be an entrepreneur. But uh, where it came from that I just had that idea, it was, it's hard for me to answer that and say that there was any one specific thing, but I knew I was athletic. I knew I had athletic ability. I could see that I was getting better at basketball, even though I didn't have any tangible results really much at that point. And again, there wasn't anybody to put the fire out. That was actually one of the good things. It was the absence of something there was nobody telling me i mean you of course you got your people in the neighborhood the kids are like oh you're not making any make the high school team who are you you know you got that but besides that there wasn't anybody who was like trying to stop me from doing it so i had the freedom to at least keep trying again and i was only 23 when i started so it was still i was still a kid pretty much at that point so uh, luckily because imagine if we had social media at that time, I probably would have been looking on social media, seeing all these other people doing way better than me. And I might've been discouraged. Right. So it's actually 100%. good that I had a limited amount of access to seeing what other everybody else was doing. Yeah. Wow. The dream killers, right. they, they stop so many people from doing things. And, you know, I've been hearing a lot of videos lately saying, Hey, you shouldn't share your dreams, your ambitions and goals with other people. You should just go do them and then let people know what happened on the backside. Do you believe in that or do you think you should start proclaiming and telling people the journey or the mission that you're on? 
I usually go with the former, actually, to not really talk about it. Uh, this guy named Derek Sivers. You've heard of him, Derek Sivers? No. Oh. He has a TED talk where he talks about that, why you shouldn't talk about your dreams. I think that's the title of it. The and, dopamine thing. Yeah, yeah. So Derek Sivers, he did this TED talk title. I believe it's titled Why You Shouldn't Talk About Your Dreams or Your Goals, or something along those lines. And he talked about how the subconscious mind doesn't understand the difference between reality and imagination. So when you mm -hmm. talk about achieving something that you haven't yet achieved, Jerome, what happens is your brain gets a little bit of satisfaction just from talking about it. And then his theory is that a little bit of satisfaction takes away a little bit of your drive and ambition to actually do it because you got the sense of satisfaction as if you did it, but you didn't do it yet. So, I mean, it's not that he's quote unquote right because there are other people who say, well, feeling like it might actually motivate you to go do it. But I actually like that idea of kind of keeping it to yourself and just focusing on what you're going to do. And I think a lot of it depends, Jerome, on the wiring of the person. Because some okay. people get energy from talking about it and feeling good about it, and it actually motivates them to actually do more. Whereas other people, when they talk about it and they talk about it as if they've done it, it takes away that drive. So I think it really depends on the wiring of the person, but I can see both sides of it. Got it. And so the wiring of the person, let's dive deep on that real quick. It, mm -hmm. Is it, what is, how does a person need to be wired in order to kind of work in silence and then reveal the results at the end versus letting people, because like John Lee Dumas, right? He's got mm -hmm. that entrepreneurs on fire podcast thing that yeah. he started, I don't know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And he, mm -hmm. they, they call it building in public, right? And so you can see his financials, you can see his downloads, right. you can see everything. And for some people, like that is every, it's the whole game. And then there's other people who um, just, well, I, just a complete yeah. secret. It's like overnight <laughs> yeah. success, even though they've been working for 15 years. Right. I, I see what you're saying. I would never do that. I would never put all my data out on the internet like John Lee Dumas. I appreciate him doing it because it's interesting to see the transparency. And I like how he talks about it. Like we made this much off ads, this much off affiliates, and this is what we're going to do next. And here's why revenue was up. Here's why it was down. Again, that works for him. So that's kind of his wiring. I think it's more of a, I don't know if I would say extrovert versus introvert than maybe simplifying it too much, but mm -hmm. I'm the type of person who I don't really like to talk too much about what I'm doing. Even after I did it, I don't like talking about it too much. I like it to kind of be like self-evident that you find out what I did, that I don't have to announce it to you. That, that's just the type of person that I am. Whereas John Lee Dumas, it's not like he's bragging when he puts his numbers out. And there are others, uh, Pat Flynn, there are others who do the same thing. Right. They're not bragging. They're informing you right? at the same time. They make themselves look good, but they're informing you. Right. So I I think it just depends on the wiring. And it's good that you have both types because mm -hmm. it shows everybody that there's no one way to do it. That's the great thing about you know, the Internet and social media is that you can see so many different ways of going about it so that everybody has, you can pick and choose who you want to model from. And you can take pieces from every person. I love it. I love it. All right. So I, I derailed you and sorry for derailing you. So you're sending out 60 tapes to agents or 20 tapes to agents. 20 tapes. I remember 20 tapes. I would have sent it to the other 40 that didn't pick up the phone because they would have known how great <laughs> I was when they got the tape. But the 20 people get it. And yeah. all of them called you back and wanted to represent you. Right. There was a bidding war. They were dropping their commissions and everything. Right. No, hell no. I, I, nobody called me back. One person called me back. So of the 20 who I sent the tape out to, I had to call them back to follow up. Of the 20 who I called back to follow up, one of them I was able to get in touch with. And he said, I'll represent you. I don't know if he was the last of the 20 that I called, but he said, I'll represent you. So I didn't call the rest of them because I said, all right, I got an agent. So he became my agent. And this is the summer of 2005. So it was about July 05. And by the end of August, he had connected me with the team or he found a team out in Lithuania and they became my first uh, contract to play pro ball. So that's how I got started in professional basketball. Come on, man. It's like a fairy tale, bro. <laughs> you didn't even call it. You didn't even call a hundred people and you got a deal. How in the world? Well, the 60 is a lot. <laughs> I was just trying to find one, you know, I'm picking with you. So, <laughs> all right. Now you're at Bally's. You yeah. get the call. Like, take me to the day you get the call. You, okay, you, great. You got to report to camp or whatever they said. I don't know what they yes. said. Great question. So my agent, what happens is usually the agent will, uh, when you're a pro ball player and you're in between jobs, you talk to your, and you reach out to your agent like once a week. And they're like, all right, nothing's happening just yet, but I'm making calls. I'm reaching out to teams. You know, they just like stay in shape, stay ready. You know, when is, when something comes, I'll let you know. It's the same conversation every week. So that's happening week after week. And finally he reaches out and says, hey, 
I'm talking to a team in Lithuania. They're interested. You know, we're talking about the the terms and all of that. But, you know, just be ready because if this goes through, you're probably going to need to leave like within 72 hours. So he's just telling me that. But he's just he's just kind of setting the he's planting the seed, but nothing is imminent yet. Nothing signed. There's no offer yet. So he just tells me that. And I'm just going to work every day. And then uh, the at day that he's oh, yeah, at Ballast, 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 okay. Yeah, so I'm working at Bally Total Fitness. I got transferred because I was I was doing so good selling. I got transferred to a couple of different locations. So I'm selling in South Philadelphia, Bally Total Fitness. That gym is still there. I think it's at LA Fitness now. I think when Bally got went out, they sold a lot of LA Fitness. So I'm working at the one in South Philly, and I'm the number two guy as far as on the sales side. I'm the number two guy. There's the head guy, and I'm right under him because I was doing so good in selling. You're making money now. Yeah. Bally Total Fitness. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm still going to a parent's house. So, <laughs> and I get the call from my agent. It was in the evening. I wasn't at work that day. I think it was like a Sunday. And he tells me the deal's done. All right. We need you to, how soon can you get on a plane? Can you get on a flight on like Tuesday or Wednesday, something like that? And I'm like, yeah, we good. We good to go. So they go get the flight and all of that stuff. And now I need to quit my job at Bally because I'm going to take this deal. So I, go to Bally Total Fitness on Monday morning. And my head manager, he was, his name was Steve. He's the guy who actually, he got promoted to the South Florida. And when he got promoted, he said, I want to bring my top salesperson with me to make my number two. That was me. So I wanted to talk to him, but he wasn't there that day. But the regional manager, his office was in that building. So they just happened to be located there. So I go see the regional manager. And I said, hey, I need to holler at you. I go sit down with him. I said, well, you know, my background's in basketball. You know, I played college ball and all that. He's like, yeah. I said, well, look, my agent just called me. Team in Lithuania wants to sign me. He didn't even let me finish the sentence. He just stuck out his hand and said, congratulations. Good luck. Because he knew what it was. He knew the deal. And in retail, people come in and out all the time, even managers. So that was the conversation. It was like two minutes. So I left. Didn't even get to talk to Steve. I didn't get to see him in person. Left. Uh, went back home. Started packing my stuff. And yeah, two days later, I was on a plane. I was flew out of Philly uh, through uh, Frankfurt Airport, a lot of airlines, Lufthansa Airlines, until Frankfurt, and then Frankfurt to um, Vilnius, which is the capital of Lithuania. And then I had to take a taxi from Vilnius to Kaunas. That was the town that I was playing in. And the taxi driver took me for about 80 bucks because I couldn't speak the language. So he, so they uh, immediately, you get your first lesson right there on the, on the ride from the airport to the, the city. So, I mean, what language do they even speak over there, man? Pardon my ignorance. Lithuania. Yeah, it's called Lithuanian. Lithuanian. Yeah. That's the language. Okay. Okay. So you're in Lithuania. You don't speak Lithuanian. No. You what did you do? Show the taxi driver a piece of paper or something to say I'm supposed to go here, a hotel reservation? Like, how does this work? So they any anytime you travel internationally, and especially if they know you don't speak the language, the the vendors and the salespeople try to get you. All right. Americans, they they know. They 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 know you got money and you don't speak the language and they'll they'll get over on you. So the my agent was American, black guy from Virginia. He connected with an agent in Lithuania. That's how the deal happened. So sometimes it's like a, a collaboration deal. So the agent in Lithuania, I believe he had went to school in America, but he spoke fluent English. He spoke English perfectly. So he was my connect. So my agent in America told me, when you get over there, call this guy. He's going to be your connect when you get to Lithuania. So I called that guy from the airport. And he said, all right, you got to get a taxi to go from the airport to where we are. And I said, how much should I pay the taxi driver? He said, pay him. And I said, taxi driver is asking me for this much money. That's what happened. He said, give him this much, but no more. And the taxi driver is like demanding, hey, you got to give me this much, this much. And they're insisting because they know that you don't know. Right. So they're, they're, just, they're just hustling. you. So he hustled me and he got about 80 bucks out of me. It was a long drive, but he got about 80 bucks out of me. And then I get over there. When I get over to the town, the agent, the Lithuanian agent picks me up at like the bus station. And he takes me to the, over there, they call it the flat, also known as an apartment. So he takes me to the apartment and he's like, yeah, we got practice tonight. Can you practice? And I stupidly said, yes, I should not have practiced that night because you have jet lag. So your body's not adjusted yet. And I shouldn't have practiced, but I practiced. And we went to practice that night and that was it. I was there. That's amazing. So you, everything's perfect from there. You got a 28 year career, <laughs> retire, everything just goes as you dreamed it would go when you were, I guess, 14, when you thought maybe basketball was the way. I wish. So when you get over there, so first of all, my coach and none of my teammates, nobody on the team or the coach spoke English, nobody. So the agent had to come to practice every day. And the coach would say something. And then the agent would translate what the coach said. And he would tell me, 
And I was on, there were multiple times in my career where that happened, where the coach would say something, then somebody else had to translate what the coach said, and they would always simplify it. Like, I'm a, I'm a very logical, rational thinker. So I want to know all the, I want to know the context of what somebody said. But when somebody's translating for you, they often strip out the context and just give you like the, the gist of it. So the coach would talk for like two minutes straight, and then I would say what he said. And then the agent would say, well, he wants you to run the pick and roll this way. And I'm like, yo, he was talking for two minutes. That's all he said. What else did he say? But, and you would, you would miss it. Uh, you would lose all the context. So that's how it was. So for the most part, I just went out there and played. Because the good news about not being able to speak the same language as the coach is that you don't have to listen to the coach. Because you can't you can act like you don't know what he said. Because you literally don't know what he said. So, <laughs> so, so I was just going out there and play. <laughs> so that was that was the fun part about it. And again, I had a couple situations where I was on a team where the coach did not speak English. So you kind of just got to do what you wanted to do. As long as you were you know, producing some type of positive outcome, it was good. Got it. Okay. So you bounce around a little bit. I, I see yeah. Germany. I feel like there's Mexico. You play in the U.S., U.K. Mm -hmm. So you're moving around. Mm -hmm. And eventually, either you say I'm done or they say we're done with you. How does the pro basketball career come to an end? Great question. So I got to give you a, a couple different things here. The first one is in sports. In sports is similar to, I would say, the entertainment space. And you could put sports under that umbrella is that I heard an athlete once say this is that sometimes you're the last person to find out your career is over. Right. <laughs> Everybody else knows awesome. that you don't know. Right. Yeah. And then you finally realize, OK, the phone's not ringing. Maybe this is over. So for me. There was a bump in the road in the middle of my career, about five years in. So my career is about nine years. So my five years in, the phone is not ringing. And I'm thinking, maybe this is it. Maybe I'm done. And at this time, I had a nice little audience online because I took that VHS tape, that workout, that uh, exposure camp video, and I put it on this new site called YouTube in 05. That's how I started building a second kind of career online. But it wasn't a career then. It was just videos on YouTube because there was no money to be made. And I didn't have any strategy, nothing like that. But by about 2009, I put videos out sporadically. <clears throat> I had a little audience, ball players who were following me because they wanted to learn basketball. And I happened to be someone who was making myself available. So my audience was growing there. But again, I wasn't not like I was monetizing it or anything like that. I wasn't selling anything, nothing. But I had an audience. Phone's not ringing for playing pro ball. So I just finished reading Tim Ferriss' four-hour work week. I remember back to uh, almost a decade earlier, I read Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And again, I told myself already, I want to be an entrepreneur. So no better time to start than the present. The phone's not ringing. So I start creating my own programs. And this is a $4.99 program, one for dribbling the basketball, one for shooting. And I made a little one-page website, and I started selling those programs to the people who are watching me on YouTube, basketball players, 13 to 24-year-old young men who are aspiring to move up. Five hours a piece, the programs. And they started selling. First day, programs start selling. <laughs> And when they started selling, I said to myself, well, look, if the phone doesn't ring again, I'm just going to do this. Now, I know I want to be an entrepreneur. I'm already on the Internet. I'm a computer geek at heart. A lot of people don't know that. And I can play ball. So I want to just combine these three things, entrepreneurship, basketball, computers. I could do that. And now it sounds like a common, easy idea now. But in 2009, this wasn't the thing. So that's what I started doing. I started selling those programs. Uh, YouTube got purchased by Google. So now you can make ad revenue off your videos. Mm -hmm. And I'd always been blogging and now social media was starting to become a thing. And I'm a, again, I told you I'm an internet guy. So I started using all these things. And I remember in 2009 telling somebody like this stuff that I'm doing on the internet, I don't know what we even, there wasn't a word for it. Like now we call it a personal brand or being a, a thought leader or an influencer. Mm -hmm. But back then I said, it wasn't a word for it. I said, what I'm doing here on the internet is going to be bigger than what I'm doing in basketball. I knew it then because I could see where it was going and also could see where my basketball career was going, right? At that point, the phone wasn't ringing, right? So I'm like, this is going to be bigger because I knew I could use, take an idea out of my head, Jerome, make it into a tangible thing, put a price tag on it and sell it, right? Well, we now call that intellectual property. Now, again, it's a common thing now, but in 2009, this wasn't a common thing. It's not like I was the first one to do it. Hey guys, as you might know, a very small percentage of the people who actually listen to this podcast are subscribers. So do us a favor, subscribe. In fact, we did some analytics and we found out that only 25% of the people who listen are subscribers. And our goal is to get that to about 75% over the next three months. So do us a favor, hit the subscribe button so you get notified when our new episodes. 
We plan to bring immense value to you guys going forward as we continue to improve the content that we created at Dreamcast. The dream should be real. But it wasn't mainstream. So when I did that, I said, man, I could do this forever. I got plenty of ideas. I know how to use a computer and I can put a price tag on it. I know how to sell as well. Remember, Bowie Total Fitness. I know how to sell. Mm -hmm. So, and again, Robert Kiyosaki, Tim Ferriss. I, I know how to sell. I've always been a salesperson all my life. Again, getting my cell phone to play basketball. I've always been a salesperson. So now I was just doing it on the internet. So luckily the phone did ring again here, Jerome. So I kept playing until 2015. But again, it was bouncing around off and on. Phone ringing, phone not ringing. Assigned, unsigned. Free agent on the team. So I just kept doing internet thing throughout all of that. So from 09 to 2015, I stopped playing in 2015. I was doing the internet thing that whole last five, six years. So when I stopped playing, I had a different type of transition than most athletes. Because most athletes, they just play 100%. percent they just focused on playing. Then it stops cold turkey. And now they got to figure out life. I had to figure out life in the middle of my career. So I had already had my next thing figured out. I knew exactly what it was going to be by the time I stopped playing because I already had it going. The momentum was already there. So I wasn't starting from zero as most athletes do. And you know, the ironic thing, Jerome, is had my basketball career gone as smoothly as I would have wanted it to, I wouldn't have had that momentum in place. You get what I'm saying? A hundred percent. And I think so many people... And I think it's good to be committed or focused or dedicated to the thing that you're working on, especially if you want to do it at a really high level. But mm -hmm. there comes a point where you actually have to consider what's next. And you did when the phone stopped ringing. So let's go back to like year five when the phone's not ringing. Did you move back uh, back home and back into your parents' house? Or like how, how did you kind of deal with that dip in outside of just kind of getting creative and saying, well, I can do this and I can do this and I can do this. Great question. So I moved out of my parents' house in 2006. So I started playing ball in 05. I played in, um, I was in Lithuania and I went to a traveling team in the U.S. and I went to Mexico, back to my parents' house. Then I got another full-time job working at a gym selling memberships, a different gym selling memberships because the phone wasn't ringing and I hadn't put away enough money to live on my own sustainably. So then I finally moved out my parents' house in 06 with the full-time job that I had. And that was still in Philly. And then in 07, I moved to, I met a girl and I moved to South Florida. So that's how I ended up in South Florida. So then I kept playing ball, played in a couple more places. I was on teams. Then in 09, phone's not ringing again. I'm in Miami at this point. Phone's not ringing, but now I have these these programs and these products going and YouTube ad revenue is starting to come in. And so that's what I did during that period. Then the phone, again, the phone would ring, then not ring, ring, then not ring. So yeah. it was like these ups and downs. But now I had something sustainable because I had this, this Internet thing going outside of the basketball thing. So, I, again, I said to myself by about 2010, if the phone doesn't ring again. I'm OK. That's where and, I was at. And was that your desire to be independent of the phone having to ring in a mm -hmm. team saying, hey, come play basketball for us? Absolutely. Because again, uh, I referenced it twice already, Robert Kiyosaki. Right, when I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad in about 2002, I realized that there was a whole different way to make money in life besides what I had seen up to that point. And I have a four-year degree in business from Penn State University. And the stuff that he was talking about in that book was never taught in those lecture halls. Not so. Right. So when I read that book, I said, oh, there's another way to make money. And I gotten roped into going to a network marketing meeting. And in those meetings, the thing that the speaker was talking about was breaking all these false beliefs that people have about here's the only way you can make money in life. And I said, oh, wait, how? why is nobody talking about this? Right, why did I have to end up in this hotel meeting to find out about these things? How, how do I have a business degree? And they're not talking about this in school. And I couldn't understand why then. I understand why now. But that was those things really those are my my entrepreneurial red pills if you if you will and that really opened my mind to this stuff so once i had that in my mind again about 2002 i said i'm gonna play basketball first then after that jerome i'm gonna do this entrepreneur thing so let me do let me get all i can get out get out of basketball then i'm gonna go do the entrepreneur thing so that was always the plan it just so happened that i kind of got forced into uh implementing that plan sooner than i wanted to well and I think a lot of times we wait until we're forced to implement the plan and to mm -hmm. do the thing. But when we do it on our own timeline, instead of letting somebody else dictate to us, uh, mm -hmm. I think we come up with a more favorable result. Mm 
And I think you probably did a mix of it's like, uh, I don't know if anybody's going to call, so I better do something. And then they call. And so it almost feels like a yo yo. It's like one of those toxic relationships where it's like, I got to get out of here. And it's like, ah, <laughs> uh, but I, I, I really love it. And then I got to get out of here. Right. <laughs> um, so I, I see the two comma club award on the wall there. Did you sell that many? What is that? Uh, the training programs? Yeah, your basketball dribbling videos. Did you sell that many basketball dribbling videos? No, that's not from that. That's from my coaching. <laughs> friend. I wish it was. Maybe it, we'll still we still get there. I gotta I gotta count up the numbers, but no, that's not from basketball. Gotta run them through the funnel, man. So yeah. on the backside, so for those of you who don't know, two comma club award, and I don't know if there's multiple over there, but the two comma club award means you did over a million dollars in business through a funnel on a platform called Click Funnels. Um what led to your ability to scale to a seven or eight figure business? Go on high ticket. If I had to give one answer, it's going high okay. ticket. So for me, the original idea, when I started selling those $4.99 programs, we were selling in volume, Jerome. We were selling in volume. I wasn't even running ads. All I would do is make a YouTube video every day, show people some little drill on how to dunk or how to shoot or how to do the Kobe move. And I would say, hey, click the link to get the program. We were selling a good amount every single day. So I figured maybe we'll just do that. We'll just volume our way. We'll $4.99 send our way up to click funnels didn't even exist then, but let's say a million dollars. Like that's what I was thinking. But over time, I realized like this is way too much. Is It's too much. It's too much doing that. I've written a lot of books and I realized that even with the books, that when you sell a lot of books, every order, all right, somebody didn't put the right apartment number in and somebody said they didn't get their order. And I'm like, this is way too much work for, for $9 and 95 cents, right? Or $50 or $70 or $42. How about I could just make you know, 25,000 in one pop? Now, how about we just go with that? So once I understood high ticket and understood the process for selling it, and then we're always in an ongoing process of figuring out how to find the right people, right? That's always an ongoing thing as far as the marketing and the, the targeting and finding the right folks at the right time and the right season. Once I realized that that's the, that can work a lot better. And on top of the fact that those people are a lot easier to deal with than your, your $10 customer. So that's where I'm going. I'm going to go to, I want to go to high ticket route. So it's not that we don't still sell. You can still buy my $5 basketball programs. We probably charge a little bit more now. You can still buy a book, but my focus is the high ticket. So that, if I had to put it to one thing, Jerome, is that focusing on high ticket. And so to garner high ticket, right, 25K or more, mm -hmm. you, you've got to solve bigger problems for folks. And so right. let's. it's one thing to teach a kid, a 13-year-old, how to dribble the basketball or how to do a crossover or dunk or right. whatever the thing is. It's something mm -hmm. totally different to work with a different group of people that have a problem that they feel is worth $25,000. So... Mm -hmm. And I think the amount of impact that you have is probably a lot greater too. So can we talk about the journey of navigating or exploring your way to um, finding that audience and then being able Absolutely. to help at least 40 of them and to solve that problem that they had? Absolutely. So the biggest thing is understanding that a problem that may be looked at as a $5 problem by one person is a $5,000 program problem for another person. So the value of a problem is relative because again, I might see, or I can't dribble the basketball that's worth $10 to me, but somebody else that might be worth a lot more, right? If, if you no know, Michael Jordan had a problem dribbling the basketball, it's worth $10 million, right? Because of the impact that solving that problem has on him. So the most important thing is who are you targeting or who are you talking to? Like your audience matters. So once I, that's another thing that I needed to realize that there are certain people out there who already understand and already agree that solving these problems for me, whatever your, whatever problems you solve, there's somebody out there who already agrees that solving this problem is worth this much money for me, whatever that high ticket number will be for you. So our jobs is not to convince people that this is worth this, it's to go find the people who already understand that and they already believe it. You just got to get yourself in front of them. So that's an, a much easier way of doing it. It's like if you're fishing, you don't want to throw your bait out there and convince the fish that they should want this bait. You want to go find the fish who already want the bait and put your stuff in front of them. And that's a much easier way of, of marketing and selling yourself. So it's just, it's a, I guess we call it targeting. And mm -hmm. when you target the right way, the right type of people, and you get the right thing in front of them, then things start working again a whole lot more easily than if you're trying to convince people that they should want to do something that they simply don't want to do. 
And so how'd you find the problem that you solve and the avatar of the people who have that problem? Because I think this is where most people struggle when they're, they're going into their next, right? They are right. trying to figure out, well, who can I help and what can I help them with? Or how, what can I help them? What problem can I help them solve? Right. So the answer to that question goes back to me being a salesperson. So I understood that when I started transitioning from basketball to what I started talking about initially was this mindset. I was just taking the mindset stuff I learned in sports and talking about it to basketball players, but then people who didn't play ball started finding me. So when I stopped playing ball in 2015, I just started talking about mindset almost exclusively. And the basketball players stayed with me, but then people who didn't play ball started coming in and I realized, okay, how am I going to get my message out to more people? And I don't know where I first heard it, but somebody said, well, why don't you just get your message in front of someone, let's say someone like yourself, who already has an audience of people who would probably benefit from that. Like, why don't you go get on somebody's stage as a speaker, get in front of somebody's audience on a podcast or somebody has a radio show, whatever that is, and which we now call, I now know as the Dream 100. I don't know if it existed at that time. So I started reaching out to people who had platforms. I started reaching, I reached out to John Lee Dumas, so we mentioned him earlier. This is before he was charging people to be on the show. I got on the show and then started getting on other people's platforms and getting on podcasts and doing speaking gigs and TED Talks. And I was even speaking for free. So I was just getting on stages and getting in front of people. And I started putting my own stuff out there, of course. And what I real what I did was once I started putting my message out there, I just saw how people were responding. People were liking it. And I realized that I had a unique uh, set of skills. The fact that I was a former athlete kind of made me different from the other speakers out there. And just my delivery, what the way I put it together, the way I put a, a label on it, I called it work on your game. And I explained why this comes from the sports world and how it applies to sports and how it can apply to you. And just my style of delivery, I realized that there were certain people who were taking to it. And once I realized what that 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 was the thing, Jerome, what I did was just let me just push this message over and over and over and over again and get it out to as many people as possible. And the right people are going to be attracted to it and the wrong people are going to be turned away from it. And that's really the. I mean, that's all marketing is, honestly. That's really the marketing in a nutshell is you're putting your message out there. Once you're clear what your message is and you know that it's valuable to a certain type of person, you keep putting that message out there until you find the right people to bite on the bait. And that's really all it is. So this is fascinating for me because I think people will hear that story and they're like, oh, man, it just it always works out for Dre. You know, it it doesn't matter. He just shows up and good things happen. And going out there and sharing your your idea, your IP, the your philosophy, uh, did everybody agree with you? No, hell no. People still don't agree with me to this day. And that's actually good. It's, it's funny that you say that because I was just uh, writing about this this morning. And, you know, we had this thing called attraction marketing. I don't know if people still use that phrase, but it was very popular maybe five, six years ago. Attraction marketing, you know, you post a picture in front of a car inside the lobby of a hotel and you look like you're successful and people are attracted to that success. And, you know, I don't know if it works anymore because so many people have done it. People got desensitized, but I came up with this thing called rejection marketing. And it's like that inverse of that. So rejection marketing is when you put out a message that, you know, some people are going to disagree with and you don't do it because you're trying to troll, but you do it because you know that you actually believe it, but you also know that some people really disagree with that. But when you do that, of course, you're going to get blowback and you may even get public blowback. But there are people who agree with you, but they may agree with you quietly. They're, they're your silent minority or the, your audience silent majority. Those are your people. Those are your people. And those are people who, like, even to this day, like, I have a lot of uh, private clients. And when I talk to them, I ask them, what is it about my message or my delivery or my style that brings you into my world. And they say, well, I like the fact that you, know, you keep it real. You're honest. You're direct. You're no BS. You're to the point. You're no fluff. And I even had people say to me, Dre, I don't always agree with everything you put out, but I respect the way that you put it out. And I respect the fact that you're objective and I respect the way that you craft your position, even if I don't agree with your conclusion. And that is, there are people out there who don't agree with my conclusion or my position or anything about me because they just don't like something that I said, but I'm completely okay with that. Because again, it's rejection marketing. My job is not to get everyone to like me because in the marketing space, any space in life, Jerome, you're trying to get everybody to like you. Then you got to be too, you have to be too vanilla. You're cutting, you're cutting your edges off everywhere. And the only place that vanilla is good is an ice cream and Oreos. Uh, it's the only place anybody cares about vanilla. <laughs> Other than that, you got to find your flavor and your flavor is not for everybody. And that's completely okay. And as a matter of fact, the more 
your flavor is distinctive to a certain person, the higher its value. And that's the that's the juxtaposition that a lot of people don't quite, they their mind doesn't turn around on that. When you understand that, that's when your value really starts to go up. Man, this is so good. Do you have an example of rejection marketing? The Man. specific <laughs> thing? Man, I could tell you so many things I can talk about when it comes to rejection marketing. Let me think of one. Uh, rejection marketing, something that I've rejected people on. So I'll go, I'll give you a couple examples and I'll think of more as I talk about it. So first one, I was in a basketball space. I would say to basketball players all the time, like, because people, I would get a lot of players who are short. Let's say players who average size five, eight, they're not making a basketball team. And they would say, well, Dre, what do I do if I'm short? I'm trying to make it. And I would say, well, first thing you got to understand is you're behind the eight ball, right? Ta talent, height is a talent in basketball. So if you're short, you are already at a disadvantage. And no matter how good you are, there may be some places where you're never going to get a chance just because you're short and has no, no bearing on your ability. And then people push back and say, well, no, Muggsy Bogues and Spud Webb, or they would name some people who are under six feet who made it in basketball. And I would say, well, uh, the exceptions prove the rule. And a lot of young males who are five, eight and five, nine and not getting taller would hate the fact that I said that because it's holding a mirror up to them. Right. So they would get rejected by the objective point that I was making. But at the same time, there were other people who might be the same height who would appreciate it because they just appreciated the objectivity of what I was saying. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's one example of it. But if you name name any any social topic that's going on today, I've talked about it. And if people don't agree with me, I get blowback. But at the same time, there are people who do agree with me and they're like, they may not, again, they won't say it publicly because they don't want to deal with the backlash. Like they don't want to catch a straight bullet standing next to me. Right. But at the same time, they will quietly, privately say, yo, I appreciate what you said there. I appreciate the fact that you put that out there because somebody needed to say it. You know what I'm saying? And I don't have a problem with it because I'm the type of person who, I, again, I'm a very logical, rational thinker. So when I see people kind of going off more uh, emotional or they're throwing these fallacies out there that I know their their logic is flawed, I don't mind talking about it. And I get blowback. I, I don't mind the blowback. That's the whole thing with me. So, again, you pick a topic. I'll happily tell you some things that have happened, but there's so many of them and that I've I, over the years. I've talked about a lot of stuff, man. Where does that self acceptance come from, man? Because a lot of people, they get the negative comment and they go hide, right? They, yeah. Somebody doesn't agree with them and they, they're like, oh my gosh, it's over. They're going to cancel me. But it sounds like you invite it. It's almost some of it is you enjoy the controversy of it. In a, in a way, it's not even that I do it to be just to draw attention. I'll give you an example in a second. I just thought of one. I told you I would. So the thing for me is I don't mind someone disagreeing as long as I know what I'm saying is sound and I know I can stand on it. So I'm not going to say something just to be sensational, just to draw attention. And there are people who do that on purpose and it works for them because they get a ton of comments and I guess they call that engagement and that gets them likes and all that. I don't do that. I'm not a shock job. I don't do that. I will talk about something because I actually believe it. Now, if you happen to disagree with me, then that's fine. And I'll give you two examples. So I remember I made a video, I made a reel on my whiteboard over here on uh, Instagram, maybe a year or so ago. And I was talking about the only three things you need to do to start a business. And I said, the first thing you need is a customer. And I hear too many people talking about why they need to start, why they need to have an LLC and they ain't got no customers. And I said, you don't need an LLC, you need a customer. And a bunch of people who I, I guess they sell their clients on getting the LLC, they got mad at me because they're like, no, you need an LLC to have a business or go to jail or you get you can get fined and all this stuff. I'm like, come on, man, if you ain't got any customers. What's the LLC for? So that was that's an example of something like that, where I'm kind of throwing rocks at a belief that a lot of people have. Yeah. And then they get mad because I'm throwing rocks at it. But I'm willing to stand on that. Like you need a customer. If you're in business, your job is to collect money, not to get paperwork. So there's one example. Another example is I remember I was in Vegas like uh, three, four years ago, me and a couple of my uh, college, former college teammates, and we're all tall. They're both taller than me. So I'm 6'4", my man's 6'6", six, six, other guy's 6'5". We're about to get on the elevator. And this is when they had like the distancing for like uh, COVID stuff. So it was only supposed to be four people in the elevator. So the elevator, and we're all in line to get on the elevator, and there's this short, petite white woman in front of us, right? And she, it looks like the way the line is working out. There's going to be four of us in the elevator, me, my two guys and her, all right, the four of us in the elevator. So uh, she could see that we could see it. So the elevator's coming and the group in front of us gets in the elevator and the woman, she sees that she's going to be with us. She runs and gets in the elevator with the other people so she could avoid getting in the elevator with us, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> now, she didn't say anything. That's just what happened. Right. So here's what I do. I go make a video. I put it on Instagram and I tell people what happened. 
I said, this is what happened. The short white lady, she saw she's going to be in the elevator with us three big black guys. She goes and gets on the elevator with the other people. And it looks like she was avoiding us. I don't know. She didn't say it. It looks like she was avoiding us. What do y'all think? She's racist. I just asked that question. So you could, you already know how that went. Like the comments went crazy, right? So people are offering all these assumptions and they're just there. It's crazy to me because again, I'm a very logical, rational thinker. So people are doing all this mind reading. They're like, oh, well, it's obvious she's racist because this, I'm like, how do you, you don't know anything. She didn't say anything. All she did was get on the elevator. Maybe she has somewhere to be. Who knows? Like, we can't make any assumptions. And then I made another video saying that. And then people are pushing back on me or, oh, you're defending her. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm just telling you logically what I see. So that's an example. Like, that's the type of person mm -hmm. that I am. And you can probably guess that you probably have a lot of experience talking to humans. Human yeah. beings are often driven by their emotions, not by logic. So when you come and you come with all this logical stuff in the face of their emotions, people get annoyed. Like, people get annoyed with me because I'm just sticking to the logic and they're trying to go with the emotion. So again, as that type of person, I know that that's going to turn off a lot of people. I'm not doing it on purpose. It's just who I am. But the people who do think logically, when they hear me and they see me doing that, they're like, oh, finally somebody gets it. Those are my clients. Those are my customers. Yeah. And you've created a space where you've differentiated yourself mm -hmm. from everybody else because they actually know where you stand. I think there's a lot of people who sit on the fence and mm -hmm. exactly. when people sit on the fence. People are confused and uh, they don't trust them because they can't predict what they're going to do because they don't know what mm -hmm. they believe. Now, you've talked about the emotion and the logic quite a bit. How does the emotion and the logic play in the mindset? Because some people, I think, would say that mindset isn't either one of those i would agree i don't think it's either one of those 100 uh, and you need emotion it's not that emotion is bad or that you don't need it because if you don't use emotion you're probably not going to move anybody to action because emotion moves people to action much more than logic does because if all it took to move people to logic to action rather was logic then there would be a line at the library instead of at the movie theater right because all the logic is in there right and nobody's there right so you need the emotion and when it comes to mindset is understanding how to use either when you need it and when to not use it when you don't need it. So I call that wisdom. Wisdom is about having all the information and the knowledge, but knowing which information to access at what times and which information to ignore and not access at different times. You only usually get that through experience. So that was that's one of the things that you know people like us who work as coaches we have experience. It's not that we necessarily have this wealth of knowledge and the reason that you hire a coach is because they know more than you. Not necessarily. It's because we have experience that allows us to apply certain things in ways that the people who we serve could benefit from. That's really what we bring to the table. And many of my clients don't even come. They're not doing the same thing that I'm doing. Uh, most of my clients are not former basketball players and they're not trying to be online influencing type of individuals are not trying to write books. I got clients in the financial space, I got clients who came from the military, I got clients who have brick and mortar businesses. I've never done any of those things, but they're still my clients because my methods for applying what I know are what give them value, not necessarily my specific uh, knowledge on a certain thing. Not that I don't have it, but that's not always the main thing that they want. Well, and I think a lot of times people are looking for somebody that knows stuff that they don't know. Mm -hmm. Right. It's access to the knowledge that they don't have or the experiences they don't have, because if they go get more of the same, they're probably going to produce the same result. So right. let's talk about work on your game and the mental workbook and like how you deliver results. Just give them a little bit on like how your process works and like who is specifically designed for, because while you've got different industries, I think they usually come to you with a similar problem. Right. So our business is based on a four part framework of mindset, strategy, systems, and accountability. That is foundation of everything is the way that you think, excuse me, you want to change your outcomes or behavior. Your first thing you have to change is your thought process. So that's number one. Second part is the strategy. That's just the game plan. We call it the reverse roadmap. So we figure out where you want to go and we deconstruct what steps need to be taken in order to get there. That's the second part. Third part is the system. How can we make sure that you're doing the things that work over and over and over again to where it becomes consistent and predictable? It becomes, a, becomes systematic. And then fourth part is the accountability. And a lot of times when people look for a coach, that's one of the things that they want. In addition to other stuff, they want accountability. Like it'll be Jerome, I know what I need to do. I'm just not doing it. Like I need somebody who I know I'm going to talk to every week who's going to hold me accountable and make sure I'm doing the right stuff. Or if I know I'm going to talk to you every week on Zoom, 
then I know I need to get this stuff done. Whereas opposed to if I'm by myself, I'll just keep putting it off week after week. So that accountability piece is not just for the person, but also for the process. How do we make sure that the process is working? Because if we're following our laid out process and not working, okay, now we got to fix the process. We got to hold the process accountable the same way we hold the people accountable. So that's our four part framework. But a lot of the coaching that I do is based on the person and what yeah. their needs are and what specifically they want and what they're working on. So for example, I have a client who's in a financial space and we're often talking about what are some things he can do marketing wise, because a lot of his business has been built on referrals and, but he also wants to be able to go out and just drum up new business out of nowhere. How can I create something out of nothing for business? So I can share with him a lot of things I've learned from marketing things like books and coaching. He can use it to get clients in a financial space. Whereas I have other clients who are making plenty of money. They may be making six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollars a year. And they're like, Dre, I don't need you to help me with my business. I got that part down. But in pursuit of all this money that I'm making in my business, I'm not spending as much time with my wife. I'm not investing into my kids. I've gained 30 pounds. I need to lose this weight. Can you help me with these parts, the discipline parts from my personal life, the professional life I'm already dealing with? And often the type of clients who I work with have more than one resource. Like they may have a resource for their specific industry. And then they come to me for like all the other stuff. You know what I'm saying? So these people are already investing in themselves. So that's another thing. If you don't go high ticket. You probably want to look for people who have already invested in high ticket and they understand it. And you're not selling them on a concept because that's more work. Not that it, it's impossible, but it's yeah, much easier yeah. to sell to someone who's already bought a thing, another or that thing, than to sell someone who's never bought it, a thing they never bought before. That education lead time is difficult but you know usually you get a client for life if you're the one that converts them so sure. did you were you a buyer of the product before you were a seller of the product because coaches uh well athletes have coaches right mm -hmm. but folks outside of athletics usually are confused when somebody says they have a coach it's like well what, what are they coaching you on so how did you get to the space from selling basketball tapes and coaching other athletes to coaching people in business? Good question. So the first thing I was, the first thing I did when I got into the entrepreneurial world out of basketball is I got a, a mentor who I wasn't paying them, but they were just helping me and giving me the game because I was helping them with, they wanted like some online stuff. They were well known in their space, but they weren't online. So I had the online stuff. They said, help me with the online stuff. I'll help you with this understanding the thought leadership stuff. So that was the first thing that I did, but that was unpaid. And then I was selling professional speaking. And then the first coach that I hired, had I sold anything high ticket yet? No, I hadn't sold high ticket yet when I started hiring coaches. So I got into coaching programs like group programs. I've always been a group program type person, but I like to work with people. I usually sell often one-on-one -on -one wow. in small groups. So that's how I did it in coaching. But I always, to nowadays, I'm always in some type of program coaching, but I usually got more than one. Yeah. I One of the things that I think people should be evaluating is whether or not their coach has a coach or in some type of developmental program, because if it's so good, then they should be partaking in it in some way, shape or form. And in no way can a coach ever have all the answers or have gotten all the development that they need. So I think that part is super important that, and it's just another way that you differentiate yourself. So I, I appreciate you sharing that. And the other thing I would say is while he didn't talk about it a lot, that's part of the reason why he was able to move what appears to be effortlessly from one place to the other, because he had people on the front side, people who had more experience than him, giving him ideas or helping him make better decisions than he probably would have made if he had to try to figure everything out on their own. And I'm putting those words in your mouth and you may not agree with me. You certainly have the option to tell me, nah, Jerome, I had it all figured out. They didn't do anything for me, but I don't think you would say that. I had none of it figured out. So that the first mentor I had, I remember that I got her information from another former athlete who was trying to become a speaker. He had went to an event, met her, gave me the number. I called her, cold called her. And she said, come meet me at Starbucks and we'll meet for 30 minutes and I'll you know, see where you're at. I'll tell you some things and you can go take it, do what you will with it. That 30 minute scheduled meeting ended up being three hours because I was just taking notes and she just kept talking. I just kept taking notes and she would stop and say, is this useful? I said, yeah, I'm taking notes. And I would show her. I was typing on Evernote and I would show her the notes I was taking. She was like, you got the, all that from me? So sometimes when you have a, a mentor, one of the best ways you can repay them, because if you're not paying them money, the best way you can repay them is to actually implement what they tell you, because it be, provides social proof 
that what they know is actually useful. So I realized that uh, very quickly when uh, working with her. So for me, no, I knew nothing, but I'm a sponge. I've always been a sponge. I've always been a reader. So you present the information to me, I'm paying attention. And she gave me the game of, all right, here's how you put together. Like you got the stuff you're doing, but you need to put it into a frame. This is what corporate wants. So you're going to get a speaking gig. You got to put this stuff into some kind of order that makes sense. And when you call them, you can say, here's who I am. Here's what I got. Here's how it can be useful for your audience. They're not going to figure that out for you. You got to figure it out for them. And then you call them. And uh, you got books, you do it this way. You can coach, you can do this, you can do consulting. Can, and she explained all that stuff to me. And then I was just helping her with the online presence because she didn't really have one at that time. So it was a trade-off. But none of that would have happened had I not made myself available. I had to be out, out there doing stuff and letting people know, here's who I am, here's what I got. And that's how I ended up meeting a person who met a person who met a person. And it's often like that third or fourth level connection person that you barely even know that is that key person. Mm -hmm. Man, this is so good, Dre. Your, your story is so inspirational um, and probably motivational as well, man. I think so few people are willing to pick up the phone because they're scared of the rejection. You've had no problem with that. You, you've been able to sell and market your way into spaces or places that probably weren't in the cars, but you believed enough in yourself and your ability and capability to go out on a limb and, and try to do things that maybe other folks didn't think was possible, but you didn't even give them an opportunity to let you know that they didn't think it was possible. And that in and of itself, I think is a gift because you were so focused on the mission and a man on a mission uh, with clarity and specificity and taking action is one that is one to watch because the outcomes are going to follow. So, I mean, you're the epitome of a dream catcher, man. And that's why I wanted to bring you on the show um, for the listeners. If they want to find out more about, uh, work on your game or some of the other stuff you have going on, what's the best place to go? Uh, best place to be work on your game, university.com. That's where we do all our programs. That's our main focus here is the university. But other than that, I'm on all the social media platforms. I'm probably most active on, I use X. I know everybody doesn't use that and formerly known as Twitter and also Instagram. So my Instagram is just my name at Dre Baldwin. I'm active on there every day with the Instagram stories and all of that. So those would be the best places. Oh. To the listeners, your dreams should be real. We'll catch you on the next episode.